So, you'll be delighted to hear that I'm not going to spend one minute for each year. I decided that would not be a very good strategy to take you back. But I will try to summarise, just to give a little bit of a flavour of some of the things that have happened in the last 20 years, including the things at COPE. So just to take you back a bit, for those of you whose memories need refreshing, those two young gentlemen at the top there, remember them? Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, both with full heads of hair at that stage. Um, mobile phones looked a little bit different. It's extraordinary to think that Google, iTunes, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter didn't exist. Things really have moved fast in terms of uh, electronics. Um, Hong Kong was still a British colony. Princess Diana was still alive for part of the time, and the first Harry Potter book was published. I'm not sure of the relevance of any of those things, but it does feel a long time ago. And yes, very important, Cope was founded, as they put it, by a Mick and two dicks. <laughs> Michael Farthing, Richard Horton, and Richard Smith, with a few others. But as Ginny said, predominantly biomedical, nearly all British. I think the Dutch were one of the uh, first to, to get in there as well. Um, but it was a small, cosy group. But as Ginny said, with very similar ideas to what we still do now, and I think very similar needs. Despite all the electronic Twitter chatter, many editors still feel quite alone. Many editors function in a lot of isolation. And I think that's been one of the things that COPE has done, is bring people together. Another extraordinary reminder of the way that the world has changed in those last 20 years. So this is access to the internet globally. And in 1995, that was the closest I could find to 97, that was less than 1% of the population. And it's now 40%. So that is an enormous change. And there seem to be an awful lot of graphs that look rather similar to that. One of them being the increase in retractions. And also, if you take it as a proportion of the number of articles published, so it's not simply that there have been a lot more articles, it has been the proportion of retractions. So this happens to be the ones out of Medline. There have been various studies on these, and I think you know, I'm not going to attempt to try and review all the various problems, but this, to me, explains why COPE does still need to exist. Uh, for example, in this uh, big analysis of the retractions, you see here, these are the ones that were retracted with no reason given. That was one of the reasons that we developed the COPE retraction guidelines, because retraction notices were not informative, and uh, the people who were doing a good job of saying, ah, actually we messed up, we have you know, some problem here, were getting tarred with the same brush and lumped together with the people who'd committed misconduct. And the people who had committed misconduct were maybe contacting the journals, threatening to sue them or whatever, um, and if there was anything defamatory, and so they were very vague uh, notices of retraction. This is another graph that looks a little bit similar, and this is the change in output of various countries, and, um, you know, a big change. So interesting that COPE has now had its first formal meeting in China, and uh, certainly the world of science publishing really has changed, as well as the electronic publishing. The players are now different. The dominance of Western Europe and North America uh, is decreasing. This was an analysis that Irene Hames did a little while ago for the Peer Review Congress. And as Ginny said, we've looked back to see what has, has changed. We didn't really find any big, and I had done another analysis of this, and, and we didn't really find great changes over time. I think in many cases, although yes, the cases are often complex, the underlying themes are very similar. So authorship seems to have stayed fairly common. Uh, conflict of interest, correction of the literature, that's an interesting one that does seem to have changed. Um, not quite sure what data means, but um, presumably disputes over data. Um, misconduct or questionable behaviour, peer review, Plagiarism has certainly not gone away, despite the fact that we now have more sensitive tools to detect it. Uh, unethical research, often relating to medicine, but could relate to things like psychology and education as well. Um, redundant duplicate publication. So 
all these issues have been consistent um, and have been cropping up and COPE has been helping editors to address them. However, I do think there have been some genuinely new types of misconduct that really weren't around 20 years ago. Uh, just to focus on three, so image manipulation. Before we had Photoshop, it was a lot harder to manipulate your images. As Ginny has mentioned, fake peer review and the rise of the predatory journal. So I'm not saying this is the definitive uh, answer of how much image manipulation goes on, but I thought this was another interesting graph. So these are cases that were referred to the um, Office of Research Integrity in the USA. And uh, interestingly, this is when Photoshop was available. It first came out for Mac. It later was available on the, on the PC. And, and you can see this steep rise in cases that involved image manipulation. So give people a tool and they will use, learn to use it and also to abuse it. Fake peer review is certainly something that keeps hitting the headlines. And I actually went back and checked because I was pretty sure that we had cases right back when I was still chair. And I was right, actually, that the first case came to cope right back in 2012, which is almost surprising because publishers still seem to be thinking of it as a new phenomenon and they still seem to be stumbling over it. I think there's been quite a considerable change in practice in terms of asking authors to suggest reviewers because this, of course, is the loophole that let the fake peer review in largely. Um, but I just included these various clippings just to show that pretty much every publisher has been affected by it. Um, so I don't think anybody has been immune and as Ginny said it does appear to be really happening on quite an industrial scale and I don't think that did exist uh, back in 1997 so that's been something that uh, we have had to respond uh, to. Open access has been a fantastic uh, thing for many publishers it's brought all sorts of interesting challenges and it has also allowed the rise of the predatory publisher. So when the author or the funder is paying, then people have seen that this was an opportunity to make money. And I'm afraid combined with the huge pressure to publish uh, and the incentives and perhaps the institutions not being very clever at really measuring quality of output rather than just quantity, those have all combined together to a perfect storm of allowing the rise of the predatory publisher. So sadly, we don't have Beale's list anymore, although I hear that a new version may be coming up. Um, but the last time Geoffrey Beale charted this, there were over 900 companies, many of which had dozens or even hundreds of journals. So we are talking about a great many journals. Um, so this, again, was something that really didn't exist back in 1997, so something that we have had to respond to. I would say also that publication ethics has become sexy. Publication ethics has hit the headlines. So there is definitely more media coverage. Whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, I think might depend on your experience of how you get treated in the media. But I think it's something that we cannot ignore. We can't exist in isolation and uh, just say, oh, COPE just sort of gets on with things. We've got to be you know, talking to the media and uh, using it. And, of course, there has been the big proliferation of the blogs, the social networks. PubPeer, relative newcomer, only five years old, that was launched for post-publication comment and, of course, has been responsible uh, for highlighting misconduct in some cases. Um, publishers are often uh, having blogs. So just as an example, here's one from Biomed Central, but the, uh, the major publishers are uh, using these as well. And here something that was looking at um, paraphrasing tools. Retraction Watch, which was one of the earlier uh, blogs, who would have thought that a blog about something as dry and dusted, when I used to tell people you know, what was I looking at, because I did a little research project before we did the COPE guidelines, and I said, I'm looking at retractions. First of all, you had to explain what a retraction was, and then you got some very funny looks as to, well, why would anybody actually look at that? And so the fact that you can actually make it fun, you can actually make it something that people want to look at, I think they've done a fantastic job, and I think that's been very interesting, and that has brought the debate to other people and widened the debate around research misconduct and around publication ethics. I think uh, you know, they've taken publishers to task for not 
uh, presenting informative retraction notices. And then publishers have also said, well, sometimes the problem lies with the institution because they're not releasing the detail. And uh, so, but it's certainly brought some lively debate. There are certainly new detection tools which publishers can use and have then got to decide how to use. And that was also something very much uh, in my time as COPE. I remember a lot of people were starting to use the text matching software and they would love COPE to say, please tell us, you know, what is plagiarism? And uh, they would have liked us to have come up with some totally simplistic and arbitrary formula and say, oh, well, you know, beyond 19% is bad and, you know, below is, is good. And we resisted and we continue to resist and say, no, you need human judgment. You can have false positives. You can have false negatives. They're fantastic tools, but they're not automatic. Uh, we've now got extra tools for detecting image manipulation. Um, the strangely named forensic droplets from the um, ORI. Um, and it's, I've sort of included that poster because I do think of it as a bit of an arms race. So as we get new tools to detect things, the people who are intent on corrupting the system get smarter at coming up their ways around it. And um, as I say, I think although the tools are really useful, that has required quite a lot of guidance. And while COPE has been influential, We've not been alone. There are many other players in this field. So there are many organisations for editors, some of them regional, some of them arranged by specialty. There are now, uh, Ginny mentioned ISMTE, the uh, managing and technical editors have their own organisation. Uh, in terms of this uh, area of what incentivises bad behaviour, um, we have had the DORA statement on the Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, the All Trials campaign, trying to get uh, trials, clinical trials, properly reported. Um, I'm involved with something called the Reward Alliance, looking at waste in research and also rewarding diligence. So trying to make sure that we don't have perverse incentives, that we do reward quality rather than quantity as well. So again, a more complex environment. It's encouraging that there are lots of people looking at the problems, but again, it means that COPE needs to interact with those. So just a little bit of bragging. I do think COPE has been influential. This probably reflects my obsession with publication ethics, but if, you, if I did a Google search and I just typed in publication ethics, look what I came up with. So the first hit was COPE, and then it was COPE on Twitter, and then it was the guidelines from COPE, and then it was the flowcharts. So, yes, I think we have made quite a mark there. Um, this was my own rather amateurish version of the timeline, which I started a little while back, I think probably when I was stepping down as, as chair. I can't quite remember when I did this. But just to sort of reiterate the growth uh, in COPE members, which actually really took off around 2006, um, and we had this sudden, really big increase when many of the publishers signed up their members. And um, particular credit, I think, to Jeremy Theobald, who was the treasurer at that time and who was just an extremely good negotiator and uh, managed to get a lot of the big publishers involved. But you can see here this growth carrying on, really, uh, in the last few years, which is really very encouraging. Publishers do not spend money if they don't have to. And the fact that publishers still think it's worth signing up their journals for COPE, I think, is a testament to the fact that we are useful and carrying on producing various guidelines, sometimes in collaboration with other organisations as well, and responding to our members. So a lot has been going on. I do think we have made a big impact. We can pat ourselves on the back quite a bit for what we have done. So my final thought, it is a birthday party, so I thought we should definitely have cake, and I hope there will be some later on. But I just wanted to quote from Richard Smith, as usual, uh, a little controversial, and uh, one of Cope's co-founders. And he said, Cope may not prove useful in the long term, and we will be delighted if it's made unnecessary, because the international profession produces an adequate response to research misconduct. And I think it is good to remember that, actually, wouldn't it be nice if Cope didn't have to exist? but there's so much evidence that we still do. COPE is not unnecessary yet, so I'd like to wish it many happy returns. I think it's still be needed for the next 20 years at least. Thank you very much.